Hello YouTube. Today's video is going to be about the Islamic intellectual history in Islamic Spain, Andalusia. And I want to present it in a way that explains many other historical phenomena in the Muslim world. I want to put it in a larger context and show the bigger picture. And many people, when they think about uh, Muslim intellectual history in Andalusia, there's two big names that often come to mind. One would be Ibn Rushd, Avros, as he's known in the West. The Muslim Maliki jurist philosopher who refuted Ghazali, and he was also a famous Maliki jurist, Mufti, who wrote a training manual for Muftis that is still used in the Muslim world today by Muftis in Training called Bidayat al Mujtahid. And the other figure that is often most thought of when one thinks of Islamic history, Islamic intellectual history in Spain, is Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, the great mystic Sufi saint. And so today I want to present a f much earlier figure from the late 800s Gregorian and early 900s who is credited with beginning a famous movement in Islamic intellectual history in Islamic Spain and the general Islamic Maghreb and that would be Ibn Masarra. And Ibn Masarra, he lived in a time where the status quo was very much like Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd embodies the status quo of Andalusia, in my opinion. Much of Andalusia, for much of its history, was ruled by state Maliki jurist philosophers and they were you might say Ash'ari in their leaning with a good mixture of falsafa of philosophy in with it and they were adherents of the Maliki Medheb and very, uh, you might say, uh, they were very uh, close-minded, bigoted, and you might even say arrogant with their Islamic school of law over all the others. And they were very serious about hair-splitting details of the Islamic religion. And they're often accused of being scholars of the exoteric meaning that they focused on hair splitting details in Islamic ritual and Islamic law and they focused on you know creating syllogisms you know logical explanations for you know theology and philosophical matters and that was what they dedicated a lot of their time to and at the same time, it's also important to understand that many of these Maliki state jurists were in political power, in positions of political power, where they might even, one jurist, he might even run a whole entire city-state, called a Ta'ifa. And they were often quite close to the Caliph, or the Sultan, or whatever you want to call him, the ruler of Islamic Spain, when there was one. And that's why I say they were kind of the epitome of the status quo. Those in power, who control things, they were the elite. You know, they were in charge, large and in charge, you might say. And the person I want to focus on, Ibn Masarra, he symbolizes or represents uh, the exact opposite in Islamic Spain. 
He represents somebody who wanted to resist the status quo, somebody who wanted to go against the grain, somebody who had different ideas as to what Islam is, how it should be understood, and how it should be practiced. And it's important, I think, when studying Islamic history to have this balanced view about at any one given time, in any one given place, there's a plethora of different ideas being discussed. There is a plethora of different things happening. And rarely is there a homogenous intellectual tradition. Um, there's multiple things going on at the same time. And that's the beauty of studying history is to understand the richness of everything that went on during every decade of every century. And I want to focus on Ibn Masara because he's known as probably the first uh, Mu'atabar, all right? The founder of the Mu'atabirun movement, which I'll get to later. And an, you know, surprisingly, in, you know, in preparation for this video, I went to go look at the Wikipedia article just to see what, what it had to say. And I was kind of dismayed that the English Wikipedia article on Ibn Masarra is only but a few lines. It, it's, it's considered a stub. Despite the fact that there's plenty of research out there. I mean, there's lots more that could be done, but there is research out there in Western languages, not to mention in Arabic. And so I was kind of shocked that, frankly, no one just sat down and took the time to add more information to Wikipedia. And this just goes to show you that, you know, not all information is on the Internet. There's a lot of information out there that you can't find on the internet that are still in these uh, old-fashioned devices here that are called books so you might want to take a look at them and there's a couple books I want to bring to your attention today and one of them was written by one of my dear teachers one of my professors at the University of Chicago Professor Yusuf Kaysuit it's entitled The Mystics of Al-Andalus Ibn Bararajan and Islamic thought in the 12th century. Another one that I want to bring to your attention is called Mysticism and Philosophy in Al-Andalus, Ibn Masarra, Ibn al-Arabi, and the Ismaili tradition from Michael Epstein. And details with these books will be put at the end of the video where I will have a list of further reading for those who are interested in knowing more about Ibn Masarra and those adventurous enough to edit the stub of a Wikipedia article that we see today. And the Arabic Wikipedia article, I'm sorry to say, isn't much better. And so I'm going to read um, something that I've prepared, something that I've written before. You can find my article in volume 64 of the journal of the Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi Society, published in 2018. And I'm going to read a small passage from it. And so just bear with me. I know reading might be boring for some people. But I quite enjoy it. And the main reason I want to talk about Ibn Masarra and the Mu'atabirun movement, because the Mu'atabirun movement and all these undercurrent movements going on in Andalusia, the culmination of Islamic thought in Spain, you might say, the the ambassador for Islamic thought in Spain to the rest of the Muslim world was, in my humble opinion, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. And to understand Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, it's important to understand his predecessors, and that's what I want to do. So a lot of this I want you to keep in the back of your head, the great figure Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. And he's also known as al-Sheikh al-Akbar, which means the great sheikh, and that refers to Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. The most important facet in understanding the Sheikh al Akbar is through his predecessors, in order to understand not only his idiolect but also his concepts. 
This is not to say that Ibn Arabi had no agency, and his ideas were a mere evolution or appropriation of others, but rather it is an acknowledgement of his intellectual milieu, which more than likely shaped his formative years, a tradition which he drew upon and then combined these ideas in an original way. Andalusian mysticism, in general, is an understudied field, and the 12th century, in particular, is not very well understood. One major question is how much the mystic figures who preceded Ibn Arabi had an impact on him, and do they help us to better understand Ibn Arabi's thought? It is clear that Ibn Arabi did, in fact, draw quite extensively from the discourses of Andalusian mystics, renunciants, Vahiris, and the general countercurrent movement against the Maliki state sponsored jurists. This informs the Sheikh al Akbar's Weltanschauung, his worldview, which in turn informs his legal theory and notions of the furur of the Sharia, meaning positive law. In other words, I am presenting a genealogy that not only elucidates figures whose legacies Ibn Arabi drew from, but also demonstrates how the power dynamics in Andalusia pushed dissidents of various types into the underground. In this countercurrent underground world of unorthodoxy, unorthodoxy, and unorthopraxy, we see an exchange of ideas between countercurrent jurists, mystics, and renunciants. Contrary to popular belief, Sufism tasawwuf, was not a trend in the Islamic West, al-Maghrib, per se. Rather, Andalusian mysticism is a predominantly indigenous form of Islamic spirituality particular to the Maghrib. This mystical philosophical this mystico philosophical trend was wholly distinct and viewed by its purveyors as a different method to Eastern Sufism. This is very important. They had their own spiritual lexicon and spoke to the Eastern Sufis in third spoke about the Eastern Sufis in third person terms. The distinct focus of Maghrabi mysticism is on the concept of Ibra crossing or I'tibar contemplation. In order to perceive the unseen, al-ghayb, through the signs, ayat, of God in nature. This would later become the main theme permeating Ibn Arabi's works, which was exported later on to the Islamic East, the Mashraq. And it is the Mashraq, the Islamic East, or we may call the core or central lands of Islam, meaning like Iraq, Syria, Palestine, uh, modern-day Kurdistan, you know, that central area of the Islamic world, Egypt, uh, was known as the Mashriq. And that is where you start seeing the term Tasawwuf, or Sufism, appear, where they didn't use that word in Islamic Spain. Uh, they didn't really use it in, Mor you know, Morocco either, or Ifriqiya, the, what, what you would now they call North Africa or Tunisia. And um, also from research that I've done, and you can see that in, a, in another video where I talk about Al-Hakim al-Tirmadhi and Imam Ghazali, is that even in uh, Khurasan and uh, what we call Marawa al-Nahr in Arabic, or Transoxania in English, what's beyond the Oxus River, um, i.e. Central Asia, they also preferred to use the word Hakim when referring to someone who is a mystic, someone whose uh, their proclivity is towards the spiritual. And so they would use Hakim or Hukama to refer to those people, whereas in Islamic Spain, they would use Mu'atabar, somebody who does Ibra, somebody who does I'tibar, they're a Mu'atabar. Hence you get what's called the Mu'atabirun movement. And that was their word for someone who was mystical or spiritual or esoteric or whatever you want to call it. And in a similar but distinct way to the Mashriq, Andalusian mysticism had a trend 
of Zuhad, renunciants, ascetics, in the 9th century. That means the 800s. But it's also important to note that not all renunciants necessarily had mystical proclivities. And this is also, I think, an important point to understanding Islamic history as a whole around the whole Muslim world. You know, if we look at Spain as being over here, you have North Africa, the Middle East, and then beyond into Persia and Central Asia. There was a trend all across the Islamic world during the 800s where you had people who wanted to abstain from the world. They wanted to give up the dunya. They wanted to make saum, uh, abstaining, fasting from the worldly life. And they often lived away from civilization, out in the desert, out in the countryside, in very rural areas. They lived without technology. They lived without any of the comforts of their day. All in an uh, objective of giving up worldly luxuries. Giving up your awham, your hawa, your, 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 your whims and your your fleeting desires, or however you want to call it, they were rejecting all of that. And, you know, some say that this came in response to a lot of income inequality and luxury that was seen amongst the Umayyads and uh, even the Abbasids. And this movement came in response to people who were just obsessed with fiqh, with Islamic jurisprudence and sharia, and they had lost really their sense of spirituality or connection with God. They were just associated with the status quo, preserving the power, the political power of the state, and, and so on and so forth. And so these people, I mean, this is perhaps what many historians may call the precursor to many of the mystical traditions, like like the Mu'atabirun movement, Tasawwuf, or, you know, the Hakim movement that we see in uh, Central Asia. Um, this Zuhad movement came first. And Ibn Masarra, he lies at the nexus between the Zuhad movement and the Mu'atabirun movement, really. He's in the middle. He's this transitory figure, if you, if you want to say it that way. And, um, you know, Zuhad being plural of Zahid, an ascetic, from the word Zuhud, asceticism. And this renunciation was in part due to the Andalusian state-sponsored intelligentsia, mostly Maliki state judges, who at times almost acted as viziers to the state. The same entente promulgated large masses of wealth amongst the state-sponsored intelligentsia. Many of the renunciants were known in biographical literature as the Munqabidun, which you might translate as retreaters. And they were pacifist, quietist resistors to the religio-political hegemony of the Maliki state jurists, also known as the Fuqaha Mushawarun, the government advisor jurists, coming from the word Shura. So you have these Munqabidun, and that, that the root is qawwa, which means to contract, to uh, restrict, to, uh, yeah, contract, constrict, uh, you know, in, in fiqh, in Islamic law, in sharia, the word is used for when you clasp your hands together. That's called qabba. So qabba, in, in uh, distinction from sadal, where you put your hands to the side and kind of let them hang, you have qabd where you're, you're clasping your hands together. And so when you put it in the form, that root in the form of mun qabidun, you're talking about a group of people who are restricting and contracting into themselves, uh, i.e. why they're called retreaters. And so they were a type of uh, zuhad or some type of renunciants people who wanted to distance themselves from the status quo, from the world, from civilization. And they uh, seem to be their own group, their own movement, coherent movement. Um, you know, that probably that word had its own political ramifications and ideas that immediately popped in people's heads when they were discussed. 
And so, going back to the Maliki state jurists, who are known as the Fuqaha, Musha, Warun, coming from the word Shura, meaning to give advice and counsel, they were uh, often found in the court of the Emir. They were in the palace. They were like lo like we might think of lobbyists nowadays. They're always with the political elite, and they were part of the establishment. They were part of the wealthy elite, often, and you know, they could have been oppressive in some people's minds. You might have had these countercurrent movements in Andalusia, these rebel movements, you might say that saw these people as corrupt. Put simply, one might say that this was a movement against scholars for dollars. The movement was an avenue for people to get away from religious discourse that was utterly dominated by state jurists. Muhammad bin Abdullah bin Masarra al-Jabali al-Qurtubi, who was born in 883 Gregorian, and died in 931, was perhaps the first major figure in the counterculture movement going against the grain of the government jurists. Ibn Arabi would later describe him as one of the truly great men of the path in knowledge, state, hal, and revelation. Palacios and Corbin, according to Adas, state that the latter Almerian school of mysticism is a mere extension of Ibn Masarra's ideas. There is no indication of any kind of homogenous mystical trend in Andalus before the appearance of the Masarri movement. Kesuit states, The basic claim that Ibn Masarra decisively influenced later authors has withstood the test of time. His abiding influence in Al-Andalus is evinced by Ibn Barrajan's Ibra-centered uh, writings. So Ibra is the main feature permeating Ibn Masarra's thought and this idea of Ibra it marries together both philosophy and mysticism. One of his extant treatises which I encourage you all to take a look at, if, especially if you know Arabic, please take a look and, and read this, or just at least skim it over. His extant treatise, is called Risalat al-I'tibar, argues that contemplation, I'tibar, leads to the same truth as revelation, wahi. In other words, that through philosophical contemplation, one may arrive to the same truths that revelation, wahi, the Qur'an, and you might even say hadith, you know, tells us through logical determination, through istiqra, deduction, we can come to the same conclusions that revelation can tell us. That's what was a big facet of Ibn Masarra's thought. Through contemplating i'tibar, you know, al-ayat al-Allah, the, 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 the signs of God in nature, we can come to the same conclusions that Revelation would tell us. And this was kind of uh, groundbreaking and it went against a lot of what many Muslims were saying at the time. And contemplation of this world can lead you to perceive things from the parallel world of the hereafter through associative correspondences. In his treatise, Ibn Masarra uses the plant kingdom as a starting point of ascension that leads to an apprehension of the divine throne. This same plant kingdom is the one which Ibn Arabi also alludes to in his many writings. Ibn Masarra shows that through i'tibar of a plant, one may gain a glimpse into the divine, into the cosmic existence. It is through creation through earthly phenomena that one may, through contemplation, ascend intellectually to the divine throne. He identifies i'tibar with the awliya, the friends of God, i.e. the saints, who have basira, insight, mystical, spiritual insight. Ibn Masarra would go down in history not only as the founder of the Almerian school, but also as the founder of the Mu'atabirun movement that was known in the early days as Al-Musarriya, 
of the Musarri movement. His teachings were a shock to his contemporaries in Andalusia, and his books were subsequently burned 30 years after his death. He was refuted by the Mashraqi scholars and Andalusian jurists, and they wanted to polemically call him a Mu'artazilite and a Baltani esotericist due to his Ismaili inspirations, which he probably learned in his travels to the Mashraq. So Ibn Masarra, if you think, uh, look at Islamic Spain being over here, he traveled across North Africa where the Ismailis had power in Algeria, Tunisia, Libya. They had power. And this is right before the Ismailis, this weird branch of the Shia, you might say, um, conquered Cairo famously and created what we now know as the Fatimid dynasty that lasted all the way up until Salahuddin Ayyubi conquered it. And so he probably ran into all these Ismaili people, their daddies, their preachers, all the way until going to Iraq where he studied with different shiuch there, different Islamic Muslim scholars. And so during the time, as a, as a trend, overall trend in the Muslim world, from Central Asia all the way to Islamic Spain, there was a text that became wildly popular. And... I recommend that everyone who's interested in Islamic history or interested in philosophy should take a look at this book. It's called The Brethren of Purity, Ikhwan as -Sufa. And we know, I think people are fairly confident, but there's quite a lot of debate about the origins of this text, what century this text is from, who actually wrote it. I'm fairly confident that it's an early text that was written by Ismaili Shia, but it's it's not as religious as you'd think. It's mostly on secular topics. And I had the, the privilege to read this text in Egypt and get a feel for the text. And I highly, like I said, highly recommend that anybody interested in uh, Islamic history, you know, take a look at this text. And it's very influenced by Neoplatonism. And the, a lot of Ismaili writings, their theology to this day, it's widely known, widely accepted by both uh, the Muslim scholarly community as well as the non-Muslim scholarly community that, you know, it's heavily influenced by Neoplatonism and he heavily influenced by the Brethren of Purity. And, you know, that's one thing that Epstein also argues in his book that I mentioned uh, earlier, and I think many other people are starting to wake up to this idea that the Ikhwan as safa the Brethren of Purity, was very popular even in Islamic Spain. And so Ibn Masarra is very, I think, influenced by this text. And, and you know, Baltani was one of those words that they kind of threw as a derogatory term to the Ismailis. So because he had some influence from Ikhwan as safa and from the Ismaili movement, you know, these uh, Maliki status quo jurists, they wanted to throw the polemic that Ibn Masarra and the Masarriya, they're all just the Baltoniya, they're all just Baltonese, they're all just esotericists that are, you know, Shia and has all these kind of ramifications, right? They're not Sunni, you know, maybe the idea is that they're not real believers, you know, their people cause disruption and rebellion and look what they, you know, are doing to Egypt because remember, it was Cairo that was conquered by the 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 Ismailis, which became known as the Fatimids, as I said, in the uh, uh, 950 or 952, something like that. So when these books are being burned 30 years later, um, you know, from Ibn Masara's death in 961, they're burning his books in Spain and calling him a Baltani. You know, that means something. Right after they conquer Cairo, that, I mean, that made had to make news all over the Muslim world, and even in Europe. And so to throw that allegation, that polemic, at Ibn Masarra and his followers is a very serious thing. It might even be like calling someone a traitor. You know, this uh, accusation of calling someone a Baltani is a very serious accusation to throw at somebody. And, you know, despite all of this uh, crazy history, um, his, follow his followers, um, even during that time they were 
they were forcibly made to disavow any connection to Ibn Masarra. But, you know, his ideas would live on. And all the persecution of the Masarriya just made, I think, Ibn Masarra's ideas more popular. He became like a famous, infamous type thing. And Muhyiddin ibn Arabi would later, you know, appreciate Ibn Masarra. And he mentions him in the Futahat in three different sections, three different times. And uh, one of the big chapters right away in the beginning of the Futahat is the chapter on Ilm al Haruf, or Science of the Letters, which I would, you know, recommend you to Michael Epstein's book on the letters, Ilm um, al Haruf, because Ibn Arabi, he says that he tackles, Ibn Arabi tackles the subject of Ilm al Haruf in the manner, in the way of Ibn Masarra. And so that's kind of my conclusion for Ibn Masarra. You know, Ibn Arabi appreciated him quite a lot, and Ibn Arabi was influenced by him quite a lot. And, you know, Ibn Arabi, like I said, he's kind of the, the culmination of, uh, you know, Islamic intellectual history in Spain. And so this just goes to show you that Ibn Masarra had a long lasting impact. You know, centuries after his death, he's still being read. He's still trying to be understood, and he's still influencing Muslim scholars. And as we know, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi brought his ideas to the Mashraq, to the central lands of Islam, and inadvertently brought Ibn Masarra's ideas also to the central Islamic lands, where things became more intermixed and ideas became more cross-fertilized. And so today, you know, that's really the legacy of Ibn Masarra. And we find him, you know, in the writings of many later Sufis, mainstream Sufis, you might call it, um, in the Islamic world. And it's also the legacy of the Ismailis. It's also the legacy of Ikhwan al-Safa. You know, all these different things, they all influence each other. And it's, you know, this is an important thing to remember, too, where, you know, as I mentioned, you had you know, Sufism in the Middle East. And why was it that, you know, the Middle East, you had Sufism, Transoxania, you had, you know, what you might call, uh, you know, the Hakim movement. And then in Islamic Spain, you had the Mu'atabirun movement. One thing that's important to remember is that before the time of Ibn Arabi, why was Ibn Arabi the first to bring it to the Middle East? Before the time of Ibn Arabi, you had the Fatimid Empire that stood in between Spain and the Middle East, essentially, as this blockade. They were anti-Sunni. The Sunnis uh, were anti fatimid you know, anti-Ismaili. And so you couldn't really travel across. They weren't open borders. If you were an openly known Ismaili in the Sunni lands, you'd be executed. Okay? That's how serious it was. And there's many texts that talk about that. You know, uh, you can read many things from the Seljuk era that will will give you that impression. It's explicitly stated. I've read it. And, you know, so there was this kind of blockade. Ideas couldn't really move as freely as we wanted, although we do know Ibn Masarra was able to travel. Um, and I think people who did travel, they had to do it incognito. They had to hide who they were. They had to hide what their real thoughts were. But still, ideas slowly were able to spread. Um, you know, so there is this, you know, different uh, dimension here. Why is it that you have this Hakim movement and Maturidism, you know, in Central Asia, whereas in Iraq you have a totally different scenario going on. You have Tasawwuf, you have, you know, very strong Mu'atazilism, you have very strong Ash'arism and all these things, and, you know, the Athari, you know, movement and all these things in Iraq. Is because you have Persia in between, a very mountainous, rugged land. You have Khorasan. And, you know, by the time you get to, uh, you know, Bukhara and these lands there in Central Asia, it's quite the distance. It's quite the challenge to travel across those terrains. Um, and so, you know, this was kind of what the situation was like. Um, in the early Islamic period when it came to mysticism. And I feel like Ibn Masarra's case is a good platform to jump off and explain other phenomena that are happening in the Muslim world. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I'll give you a list of 
you know, books and articles and things for further reading for those that are interested. And please subscribe to my channel, give it a like, and, you know, support me in any way you can so I can keep making quality videos for all of you. Salam alaikum. رحمة الحق المبين هو محي الدين حقا شيخ كل العارفين هو محي الدين حقا غوث كل Goodbye.